we're going to uh, show now the a video from FCC Chairman Pai. I mentioned earlier he uh, informed me late yesterday he wasn't going to be able to make it uh, because of coronavirus concerns, as, as well as uh, Commissioner Carr uh, uh, informed me the same thing, and we were sorry about that. But Chairman Pai kindly did a uh, video, which I'm very grateful for. To be really honest, believe it or not, I haven't had a chance to watch the video. It, w it was a busy day yesterday afternoon uh, with everything going on with the uh, concerns about the virus. So I'm eagerly anticipating hearing what Chairman Pai has to say. He won't be able to, of course, take any questions, but we have Twitter. You uh, have the Twitter handle, hashtag FSFCONF12, and I know he's active on Twitter, so as far as I'm concerned, you could tweet, a, tweet uh, comments and whatever. But we're grateful he did it, so let uh, the video roll, please. Hey, everyone. Thank you to Randy May and the Free State Foundation for this opportunity to address you remotely. I'd hoped to be with all of you in person today, but let's just say that was a tough sell, considering my wife is an immunologist who used to work on infectious disease at the National Institutes of Health. But speaking to you by video means, I have a very limited time before I lose your interest, so I'm just going to focus on the hottest issue at the FCC these days, 5G. Now, this audience, of course, doesn't need a tutorial on the basics of 5G, but I just came across a new report on 5G's economic potential that seems worth sharing. According to an analysis by a Pepperdine economist that was released just last month, 5G will create 8.5 million new jobs from 2019 to 2025. These jobs will pay significantly more than the median salary in the United States and it will generate $560 billion in wages and add over $900 billion to United States GDP. That is why the FCC has been pursuing a strategy to facilitate America's superiority in 5G technology. The 5G Fast Plan includes three key components, freeing up spectrum, promoting wireless infrastructure, and modernizing regulations to encourage fiber deployment. We have been hard at work executing this plan, and I am pleased to report meaningful progress on all three fronts. In 2018, the number of wireless small cells deployed in the United States more than quadrupled, from 13,000 to more than 60,000. In 2018, we set a record for fiber deployment, with build-out to nearly 6 million homes, and then we broke that record in 2019, with deployment to 7 million locations. On Spectrum, we're taking an aggressive, all-of-the-above approach. We're freeing up high, mid, and low-band spectrum for 5G. Last year, the FCC successfully concluded the 28 GHz and 24 GHz bands, respectively. And we recently concluded bidding in an auction of the upper 37, 39, and 47 GHz spectrum bands. All told, we are making available almost 5 GHz of high-band spectrum for commercial use. To put that in perspective, that is more spectrum than is currently used for terrestrial mobile broadband by all wireless service providers in the United States, combined. On low band spectrum, we're repurposing spectrum in the 600 MHz band, which was long used for broadcast television, for mobile broadband. We are on track to complete, on time, the post-incentive auction broadcast repack that is necessary to put that spectrum to full use across the country. And lately, we've been focused a lot on midband spectrum, which is especially appealing for 5G because it combines good geographic coverage with good capacity. Now, back in 2017, immediately after I became chairman, we took stock of where things stood on midband spectrum. Unfortunately, the cupboard was virtually bare. There was an incomplete 3.5 GHz initiative that was unlikely to lead to commercial 5G deployments, giving problematic rules adopted during the prior administration. Other than that, the agency had nothing, nothing at all, on the shelf. And so, just months after I took office, I did something about it. I proposed, and the FCC unanimously adopted, a notice of inquiry, 
kickstarting the conversation about potential use of midband spectrum and how our rules could be modified to promote additional access to these airwaves. Since then, we have systematically identified midband airwaves that were being unused or underused and set plans to put these airwaves to work for the American people. It would take too long to tick through every single proceeding that we've been working on. But just to give one example, the Commission adopted flexible new rules for the 2.5 GHz band in July of 2019. This is our nation's single largest band of contiguous spectrum, below 3 GHz, and it is well suited for 5G deployment. About a month ago, we opened a tribal priority window so that tribal nations in rural America have early access to this spectrum. And we intend to auction any remaining spectrum in the 2.5 GHz band shortly after this window closes. In the end, this spectrum will yield about 200 MHz for 5G and other wireless services. Also, under Commissioner O'Reilly's leadership, we reformed our rules for the 3.5 GHz band to encourage 5G deployment. And this summer, we'll be auctioning 70 MHz of priority access licenses in that band. Two weeks ago, the FCC took its most significant action yet to repurpose midband airways for 5G, when the Commission majority voted to repurpose 280 MHz of the C-band for flexible use. As you know, the C-band is a 500 MHz swath of spectrum, from 3.7 GHz to 4.2 GHz. It's mostly used by fixed satellite companies to beam content to video and audio broadcasters, cable systems, and other content distributors. And we can make available much of that band because satellite companies don't need all 500 megahertz to continue providing the services that they are providing today. The Commission's been taking a close look at the possibilities for 5G in the C-band since we initiated a formal inquiry on midband spectrum in 2017, just a few months after I became chairman. We launched a rulemaking to repurpose parts of the C-band in 2018. And last month, the FCC majority advanced my proposal to make a significant portion of this band available for 5G. This plan would free up a significant amount of spectrum for next-generation wireless services, with an auction starting on December 8th of 2020. It would generate significant revenue for the United States Treasury. And it would protect the important services that are currently delivered using this spectrum. So, when it comes to spectrum, we're on the right track and producing results. This January, a study projected that by the end of this year, as many as three quarters of the world's 5G subscriptions would be found in just two countries, the United States and South Korea. That's 5G fast. In this and in other areas, we rely on the expertise and dedication of private stakeholders, including the Free State Foundation. I appreciate the work that Free State has done on 5G, regulatory modernization, and so many other areas that are ripe for change. Thanks again, and have a great conference. Well, no. no? Oh, I think it is now. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks to Chairman Pai again for uh, that video. Uh, we appreciate it, and I bet we'll touch on some of those same themes here in this conversation. I want to 
I'm, I'm not going to do the long introductions, frankly. I've got the, uh, you have the brochure, and uh, both uh, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly and Commissioner Clyburn have been here uh, previously. And if it's okay with Commissioner O'Reilly, and I'm going to, I know you're not on the commission anymore, uh -huh. but I think once a commissioner, for my purpose, is always a commissioner. And I'm going to, uh, uh, but refer not going to, to open meetings is a and, great thing. And, but, uh, so I, <laughs> I uh, may refer to you as Commissioner uh, Clyburn, but I think we're also all friends here of long standing. So if I slip into Mike or Minion, I hope you'll accept that as well. Uh, so first, I'm going, to, but I'm going to do the really short version of the uh, introduction, and I turn to Commissioner O'Reilly first. He was nominated uh, by President Obama in August of 2013, confirmed unanimously by the Senate. You don't have an opportunity these days to say that phrase too many times, confirmed unanimously by the Senate, sworn into office in 2013, and then in January 2015, he was sworn in for a new term following his renomination by uh, the President Obama and confirmation by the Senate. The uh, thing I would say about Commissioner O'Reilly in terms of his bio is, and if, if you look at it, you'll see he spent a, a number of years uh, serving on the Hill in various important capacities in different committees and with different senators, and, and uh, he uh, did that for many years, so he has that perspective that is very useful from having served on the the Hill. And uh, I may say this again when we have our exchange back and forth, uh, and I don't think he'll say anything that'll make me take it back. But I, 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 I will Still say I, I admire uh, Commissioner O'Reilly an awful lot for. A lot of things he has done and led at the commission, but especially for my purposes in the area of, of things that I would put under the rubric of regulatory reform and just process reform. I know you've been a leader, so I, I uh, appreciate that. Okay, Commissioner Clyburn, it's wonderful to have you back with us again. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, and I just wanna say at the outset that Commissioner Clyburn when she was a commissioner, was always uh, very uh, gracious uh, to come and be with us uh, when you were a commissioner. Uh, and I'm glad you're able to be back uh, with us. And, uh, you know, you and I know, and a lot of the people in the audience know that, that we don't agree on every single issue, probably. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I would say on, on a lot of issues, but I value, uh, uh, the fact that you are always uh, willing to come and, and have this dialogue and conversation, and I appreciate that. And I'll let you know that I don't pick uh, my friends based on uh, agreement with um, every issue. If I did, um, I would not value the friendship. Well, I, I value uh, having you here and our friendship. So the brief version, uh, Commissioner Clyburn served as a uh, commissioner at the FCC from 2009, 2009 to 2018, and as acting chair, and this is important, from May to November of 2013, uh, and you were the, the first uh, woman chair of the commission, uh, first African-American chair of the commission as well. Uh, female. Female. Right. Yeah. And uh, There are two people who would uh, <laughs> take exception to that well, one, I think. <laughs> Uh, you are right. I mean, see, I'm, you know, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> God, that was so. Thank you for. No, I just uh, want that, you to be able to walk down the street. That correct. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Female is what I'm. I meant to say. Uh, you know, <coughs> so, so prior to serving at the uh, FCC, you served a number of years at the South Carolina yes. Commissioner, and uh, I guess I'll just ask you this question mm -hmm. right off the bat: was was the, the Mr. Clyburn, the Congressman Clyburn, that seemed to have so much to do with that South Carolina election that I read about, was that your dad that- We're that related. I've known him for about uh, almost 58 years. Um, 
Okay. Uh, he okay. had something to do with my upbringing, maybe right. not uh, uh, the, the, the birth, but definitely uh, <laughs> a lot of other things that I guess I'm digging myself into this hole. But yes, that's my father. Okay, well, <laughs> the reason I ask, because when you decide, if and when you decide to go back to South Carolina mm -hmm. and run for office, you better get him on your side. I know, okay. I know. There seems to be a secret sauce. You're right. All right. Okay. Well, not so secret, huh? Okay, now let's uh, delve in, and we're going to do a lot of substance, but as you two know, often when you're here and we have these conversations, I, I just like to uh, start off with a couple of, of more personal and less substantive things. And so we're going to do this as a lightning round, the, do the lightning round up, up front. Uh, if a newly firm commissioner comes to you and asks, what is the single most important practical advice you can give me as I begin this job, what would it be? You want to go first? I would say uh, embrace and recognize and fix what you think is wrong. Uh, the great thing about being a public servant uh, is you can be unapologetic about um, narrowing divides and, um, and, and addressing uh, issues uh, that uh, people um, you know, care about or need. Uh, so through an agency's perspective, you know, I, I would say be very unapologetic uh, about doing that and embrace that. And, uh, and then uh, at the end of the year term, you will be able to say, well done. Commissioner Riley. Mine's going to be a little bit more basic. Um, you know, it's the things I learned kindergarten through like second grade. It, read and listen. You know, read the items, read the material, read the briefings, read the record. Listen to people when they come in. Don't tell them everything. You know, we have to make a lot of public events, and that's we're happy to do so to get the message out from the commission. But it's really learning from others to be able to make a more informed decision. Um, and I'm not sure that all my uh, colleagues, I know Commissioner Clyburn certainly did. I was did, about to say, uh, don't start early now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you, you did. You know I will come back. <laughs> but I know there's you know, former chairman that I worked with who didn't read the items. And it's almost impossible to negotiate with someone who hasn't read the item. Um, and so that's why I, I read the material. It's the most basic thing. How many former chairmen have you worked with? Mm -hmm. No, I won't. <laughs> I, I won't go there. He okay, won't now, be able to walk up the street. Now, this, is the light, this is the lightning round, so I, the number two. Uh, what is the most enjoyable aspect of your job? Or you could take the other side and tell me the most frustrating aspect of your job, and I'll turn to you first, Mike. Oh, oh, no, please. Go, please. The most enjoyable uh, was, uh, I, I can think of, and I will make this a composite, uh, when that someone comes up to me and say, you know, says thank you about an item, you know, say like inmate calling, which we did not go um, you know, far enough. You know I was going to say it early. Um, <laughs> Lifeline, which you know I have an issue with. But, you know, uh, those pe you know, people who are um, either economically or, or, or otherwise, um, you know, disadvantaged, when they are able to benefit from the change you have instituted and say thank you for it and you see what a difference you've made, um, enabling broadband opportunities where it didn't exist before. You know, those are, um, that's my most fulfilling. Um, I answered it through um, my uh, a very natural exchange with um, my former colleague. Um, there were a lot of frustrations. There are things that we didn't get done. There are things that I absolutely know um, should have been uh, done better, can be done better. And when you s are so close to the finish line, you could see it over the horizon and then you don't get there. I find that incredibly uh, frustrating. Um, and so I, I will say um, oftentimes that coin analogy is, uh, it, it, it is you know, a very appropriate uh, for these times because you've got the same coin, you've got two sides. Um, and uh, and they can, um, they're definitely on the opposite end uh, and it can be frustrating. Uh, Mike? Well, I would answer it, and I would actually agree with my colleague. What? Uh, absolutely. I think it, <laughs> when someone comes to you and says, thank you for something you did that actually worked, you're like, oh, goodness, that is really refreshing um, to know that your work actually benefited. And, then, and, and, the, and a parallel to that is when they come up and say, you know, I know you've been advocating on an issue, which you just talked about some that you've worked on. I, I, I agree with you. I know you haven't gotten over the hump yet, but you're right. Keep going. Those two things and, and, and that, that, the message of, you know, you're doing the right thing, it's just so rewarding. Okay, and then the final one of these uh, types of questions is, is this. 
what is the most memorable or the most important book you've read or movie you've watched in the, the last year? To admit this is to admit I took a couple of years to get this book, but I did the book in the, in the movie, did not know I was going to be able to see the movie uh, within months of each other, but Brian Stevens is just mercy. Um, when I read that book, I, I, and uh, when I saw that film, it just, to me, just reinforced my purpose. I mean, regardless of my 19 years in public service and, and what I'm doing now, um, honestly, you know, I'm not taking on a client that doesn't um, in, in some way continue uh, that. And if you're not, most of you are familiar, um, that is just really attempting to uh, uh, enable us to change our minds and opinions on how we uh, treat and look at those who are incarcerated. And part mm -hmm. of that dynamic for me, of course, and I said that to Brian Stevenson, um, you know, I'm really still working, even though I'm not there, on reforming of the inmate calling services regime. It just, um, the humanization of that and to look at, and this is supposed to be lightning round, but you this knew when is, you got me. This is lightning round. You know, you knew when you got me here, it wasn't going to be a lightning <laughs> answer, okay? We'll, we'll um, but, but, you know, I mean, just really, you know, that just, uh, you know, to me, just, um, um, you know, it's sort of a, a personal check to us that um, even when somebody has done something incredibly wrong, and there are people in there who have not done anything wrong other than be, being born on the wrong side of the track, um, that um, they're humans and should be treated accordingly. Okay. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, uh, do you have a, uh, we'll a book it. or a movie? That... Yeah, I think at the heart of your question is something, uh, you know, an opportunity to read for pleasure or watch something, a movie, um, which I got two little ones. I don't get anything for uh, any time. I, but I will say that just this weekend, my four-year-old, we watched the first movie that she had ever had an opportunity, um, and I was able to convince her not to watch Frozen, we watched the movie Sing, um, which the good part is we got to see it four times in about three hours. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's, I wouldn't know if it's that influential, but it was my daughter seeing a movie that was, you know, wasn't a 15 minute episode and she grasped most of it and then we got to see it over and over and over. And over. And over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for all of that. And now we're going to uh, move into some of the topical issues uh, that most of you are familiar uh, uh, with and delve into those uh, somewhat. I'll start by just saying once more that as you can see above me with the image, the, the theme of today's conference is Broadband Beyond 2020, Competition, Freedom, and Privacy. When I uh, was introducing the conference this morning, I, I did point out that, that when I came up when we came up with that topic that I did hope to get people thinking about the beyond 2020 part of uh, that theme and looking to the future, how we get from here to there on whatever whatever uh, course we're, we're on. So I think the way I'm going to start, but this time I'm really, because I've got a whole bunch of, you know, questions that <laughs> I... That I, I I'll think try to I'll be come more up. succinct. So, but, I but I'm going to try this to see whether it works, and then if not, uh, my friends will uh, indulge me in cutting them off. Just I thought if if you could, with that theme in mind, if you just take let's just say one or two minutes uh, now, and then we'll get to other stuff, and uh, tell us uh, what comes to mind foremost uh, to. Uh, uh, move forward uh, with the broadband beyond 2020 theme. Uh, it, I, we've been deferring to the lady. Um, so I, I guess to recognize that with each decision we make, we have an opportunity to be two things, incredibly efficient and incredibly effective. And so uh, I look at um, anything before me or that was before me in um, as robust a bucket as I can, meaning that um, what can this item do to enable the most return on our investment of bringing forth that item? Uh, and, and, and to me, just, just looking at the um, regulatory matrix um, that, um, you know, if we want to narrow divides uh, when it comes to uh, digital opportunities. Then what are all the items or elements that under our control that we can do to get there? It is simply not just 
uh, investment in infrastructure. It is also affordability and access uh, to those um, services that um, the infrastructure will enable. So how can we do all of the above in order to uh, realize the uh, most return on that investment? And I think that I did that under in two minutes. I'm proud of myself. Thank you. <laughs> Mike. Well, I, uh, not to counter with my colleague a little bit, but I would say that you know, it's hard to think about beyond 2020 when we have so many American locations, consumers, families that don't have broadband today. And it's not something that, that, that just has occurred to me. It's been something we've been working on hard at the commission for quite a while. But our plans are 10 years out, six years to build, eight years. You know, you're talking a, a number of years. They're going to outlive both you know, my time at the commission and others. And that only gets to certain components and certain people being served. We still have millions of other Americans that need to be addressed. And you know, we talk about phase two of RDOF and things of that nature, when that's going to happen and how long it's going to take. We have so many people that are in need. And I like to think about all the other issues, and I've worked on them in the past life that, that Randy mentioned in my time in Capitol Hill for, you know, competition, privacy, other things. But here, it's really trying to be so focused on getting the most, you know, sufficient broadband to as many locations to every American who wants it as soon as possible. And that's what I've really tried to stay focused on in, in the broadband sphere. Okay. Uh, you know, what? While you were saying that, I was thinking that when you were talking about being focused, I think just uh, within the past week, <coughs> maybe it was in the context of the C-band proceeding that we're going to get to or some other spectrum proceeding, but Commissioner O'Reilly said in one of his statements that on those spectrum matters that he had been a workhorse. I think that was the word you used. And, you know, I'll just say, because he will, probably wouldn't say it again here, but but he really has been a workhorse. And they're complicated, and they take a lot of work and time. And, and you know, uh, I appreciate it. Well, you're very uh, kind. I, in fairness, uh, just to be, I don't want to say I'm too modest here, but I just said that workhorses get things done. I didn't say that I was a workhorse. No. I just said, you know, you could read into that, and if that's okay, And too, I was reading uh, into that, too. Well, then, <laughs> then I'll accept that fate. Well, I, I read into but it. But I had, a, I had a, a, a you know, my first boss in Washington, D.C., so, you know, you can be a workhorse, you can be a show horse. That, you know, pick, pick your path. You can worry about the PR, you can worry about the substance. His goal was to do the work during the week and then go home to his loving wife and his kids and spend time um, going to church on Sunday and after brunch. Uh, uh, and so when the calls would come in for meet the press or to do all the things that he, you know, that he was important to the, to the job, he wanted to be with his family, and he wouldn't think twice about, I'm sorry, I'm going to miss that. I'm, when I'm in D.C., I'm going to work my hardest, um, but it's having that balance. And so I work as hard as I can. Um, I don't worry much about you know, being on Meet the Press or whatever the circumstance may be. Uh, the PR part's going to have to, to you know, people are going to say what they're going to say, and, and I'm just not going to be uh, worried about the best video or the best picture or the prettiest person I can be. I'm just going to have to let the work speak for itself. Well, I, you know, in my opinion, I think this is equally as important as being on Meet the Press. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, oh, I thought the, you were going to say something about being pretty. No, I, I, I was no. waiting for that. Uh, okay, now, I'm going to ask you about telehealth. To be honest, when I wrote these out just a week or so ago, I had a question about telehealth back towards the back. But, but I think in light of today's... Uh, you know, concerns about the coronavirus, it's, it's an important question to, to ask. Uh, and I just uh, have uh, this background. Just in the past couple of days, you know, listening to the news, I've, I have heard reports about how there are uh, people that have all of a sudden become more comfortable in, uh, in, in light of the concern about spreading the virus with, with using Tele, telehealth types of platforms. And of course, they depend on broadband, which is our subject. So we all understand what we're talking about. And I'll just ask you, maybe first, Commissioner Riley, and I know actually Commissioner Carr has been involved in this over at the commission, but you have, when you think about what's going on today and then broadband and connecting that with telehealth, do you have any uh, thoughts in the current context? Sure. Um, it's, it's a very important topic. I should 
tell you all I'm suffering from seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. um, at every show, you can look back in the videos. Right. Uh, Randy can attest it's to this. It's true. I, I have you know, ha had difficulty being able to see, and my eyes would get blurred. So that's my problem right at the moment, and that's not significant given all the issues that are, people are facing. I just wanted you to know what's happening to me right now if I look terrible. Um, not pretty, is it? Um, but you're, to, on telehealth, I, when I think of telehealth, I think of, you know, given my past background, I know all the work that's being done outside of the Commission on Telehealth. Medicare, Medicaid, HHS, tons of, of programs that exist today and they're funding and, 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 and making operational um, the, the benefits of telehealth and trying to address the needs uh, of Americans who um, find themselves in a difficult situation um, given the circumstances. So it's going to be a growing uh, area, but there's only so much, and you know, there's only so much this commission can do. We do not have a huge resource of funding for this purpose compared to the rest of the federal government, compared to everything else. I've suggested in the past that we should get credit against our budget for the money we spent compared to other agencies. I haven't won that argument yet. Uh, that's okay. But it isn't, you know, it is an important um, component going forward. Um, it doesn't necessarily, in some instances, require broadband. But depending on your definition, at 25.3, a lot of services can operate on a much lower level and you can serve more people. The key is having telehealth to, you know, what benefits we can bring to as many people and, and getting them healthy. So this is one of those places where uh, my friend uh, and I uh, disagree. We, we had this thing going back and forth, so don't, it, it's not as, yeah, it is as serious as it looks. Um, but I think the FCC can and does play a, a, a vital uh, role when it comes uh, to health, telehealth opportunities. Um, while financially we don't um, contribute much um, as much as I would like for us to do, and you know, in terms of a rural um, connect to health uh, fund, and the like, um, you know, we are responsible for, you know, devices, connected devices, um, uh, you know, green lighting them that will enable opportunities. Um, one of the things, and I took some heat on a couple of these things, mobility fund phase next, um, you know, uh, when, when we were fighting to, to make that robust. I mean, I got a lot of heat about that, but my thing was, uh, in terms of the most ubiquitous uh, device or platforms that people can use to bridge uh, the divide between where they are physically and where their clinician may be, maybe that, um, uh, you know, that telephonic, that mobile device. And if they don't have a robust connection, um, if uh, they are one of the 10 or 12 million Lifeline uh, customers that um, then only have 200 minutes or 200 texts, then their opportunities will be limited. And so that's one reason why I pushed for the Connect to Health Task Force at the FCC that uh, was, is allowing the FCC to look at itself and say, are there other things that we can do to work uh, inter you know, interagency um, and, and, and again, to, to be um, a prophet, so to speak, uh, you know, to, to, to be one who will speak uh, more about these issues and opportunities. So that's what we, you know, in terms of, you know, how I view it, um, I think the FCC has a very significant role in enabling opportunities and improvements in the lifeline and um, paying more attention to the, some of the uh, connected health initiatives and being more robust, and it's doing so in this case, um, uh, in some cases, um, you know, the, um, the fund that will enable more opportunities with uh, uh, clinics and the like, um, those are ways that we can be positive conduits um, uh, for these opportunities. Do, do you want to respond to well, I don't disagree with all the good points she made. I, I was just putting in perspective of all the other agencies that are, you know, have much more resources, much more authority, much more influence. It doesn't mean that ours isn't important. Um, it just means that it is somewhat limited in comparison. That's a, the point I was making. And, and we're talking about the new initiative we have. You know, uh, we have an NPRM on, mm -hmm. on, on uh, connected yes. care. Um, and, and at some point soon, I think, I, I think Commissioner Carr said he wants to get to final order soon. But that is you know, months away. Um, and it's going to you know, talk about pilot projects. Um, they will take a considerable amount of time to set up and operate. Um, and then from that data, we'll be able to figure out maybe something from them to decide something. And we're talking a while away. So there's, you know, that is a fact. That's not going to help the people today that have coronavirus or that are potentially susceptible. So my counter-counter mm -hmm. to that <laughs> is, um, 
is is that um, you know that that causes a ripple you know in the ocean and it will allow for others the opportunity to um, to to uh, you know uh, to be a part. I was trying to think of a, a, a aquatic um, uh, equivalent and I'm not coming up with it as as quickly, but. Um, Get a roar, roar. I don't know. Anyway, but you know where I'm headed. Um, but but it, it, it's it's not insignificant um, for. And I, I know that's not what you're saying. But um, you know, no, I just but I to, think, I just I think your point. analogy's and, okay. It's throwing a rock in the ocean. Right. Uh, oh, and, and and secondly, <laughs> in terms of um, you know um, what what can be done in real time. You know, somebody um, uh, direct messaged me on 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 Twitter um, about that about this. And and I said, you know, you've got companies. Um, that um, have uh, consumers um, or, or uh, cl customers um, that might have a limited uh, bandwidth plan. Um, you know, maybe in the interim, especially if um, you know children are not able to get to school or, 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 or parents are displaced financially, um, can we relax? Um, you know that um, you know plan. Can we expand on it? Can we um, uh, en enable more hotspots, Wi-Fi hotspots, to uh, to be um, um, you know set up or or, or devices to be checked out. So there are a number okay. of things that the FCC can do that are more things that private industry could do because this has a potentially to be incredibly economically disruptive. And that's, it's not just South by Southwest. We were talking about that at the table. It has the potential to disrupt already vulnerable people because the first line of people who will get disrupted economically will be those wage workers. Okay, let's I, uh, no, I told I you think I'm not this... lighting around, so I guess I won't get an invitation back. So it's a pleasure being here today. <laughs> if I don't see you again, you know why. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you know you'll uh, be welcome back. And but, and, but I was just going to say, and I think this exchange you know, was really helpful. My, and when I think about it, I think one thing we probably all ag can agree on is that the current crisis, you know, which no one or crisis may be too strong, depending on one's perspective, but the current situation, no one wished for it, but I think it will likely have the effect of, of, you know, for those people that are exercising whatever options are presently available for telehealth, it'll it'll increase the awareness and the, uh, make us more sensitive to the value of it, which will then, you know, we used to talk about virtual cycles, and it may and it may cause people to appreciate more why it's important in addition to all the other reasons to have broadband. So you I don't know, disagree that's, with that, but no. you know, one of the things that we, and, and when I talked about efficiency and effectiveness, we need to come out of our silos. Because when, when you talk about a connected person um, and um, connected, looking at the healthcare portfolio, there's a business case, a positive business case that has a positive um, I, I don't want to say tsunami, but I mean a, a, an incredible effect that could be realized. Um, just looking at some of the pilots that the FCC did a number of years ago um, uh, that uh, allowed for um, you know broadband um, uh, services, uh, you know, for uh, the anchor institutions uh, for rural communities. My goodness, there's like a three to one, a ten to one return on savings or investments uh, that the FCC en enabled. Um, you know, in South Carolina, I mean, just one program could have paid for um, the investment the FCC made three to one in terms of the telepsychiatry. So what I'm saying okay. is, you know, again, not to co-op co or, 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 you know, okay. I, I, we just need to look at it in a broader sense because this makes economic sense for us to expand. Okay. Now, you mentioned the word investment. So I'm, then this is going to be with you and to you and... Uh, it, it involves investment and net neutrality. Now, it's been pretty remarkable, honestly. Both of you weren't here throughout this whole conference, but you know, we, there's been very little discussion about net neutrality uh, today. You said very in, little. In, in real, very, very little. Okay. I said, okay. you know, it's been a lot about spectrum and a lot about spectrum, <laughs> but net neutrality, I, you know, has not gone away. Really, it should, and, and it, it, in my view, it should. But here's, I'm going to put this question first to Commissioner Clyburn. I, I probably know what she'll say, but you know what? I think she may surprise me here. I'm and then right. I'm going to give Commissioner O'Reilly a response, so mm -hmm. a chance to respond. Uh, 
During your nearly 10 years as an FCC commissioner, including a history-making stint as the first woman to serve as acting chairperson, I got it, got, got it right. that right. Yeah. And I'm just going to read this because I okay. wrote it out. You are a strong advocate for the regulation of Internet access as a telecommunications service under Title II. Just over five years have passed since the Wheeler FCC applied common carrier rules, and a little more than two since Chairman Pai led a 3-2 Republican majority over your objection to overturn that decision and reclassify broadband as an information service subject to minimal regulation under Title I. Industry data suggests that during the roughly three years that Title II applied, investment in broadband infrastructure declined. I think there's some agreement that that's the case. Meanwhile, in the two years since the Restoring Internet Freedom Order was adopted, investment levels have gone back up. You know, there's perhaps some disagreement, but I think there's more widespread agreement that investment has gone back up. Uh, and importantly, by most accounts, we've not witnessed the harms materialize that Title II advocates predicted. So, Commissioner Clyburn, has the real world experience of the past two years at all tempered your concerns about the need for public utility regulation of internet access? And should a Democrat take the White House in November, would you still support yet another reclassification decision by the FCC, or would you prefer that Congress once and for all resolve this issue. I'll just put all those questions okay. together. So uh, here's where I'm going to surprise you. And I'm going to say something that I don't necessarily mean wholeheartedly, but I'm going to put it out here. I'm going to have uh, exercise my own neutrality right now. Neither Title II nor its repeal has had any real impact on investment. Hmm. I'm going to put that out there. Because when you look at the numbers, we can play, um, I had something that I said I was going to say, battle of the uh, investment analyst stars. We can, have a, we can talk all day about, I can show you figures, and then I can counter you figures. And I can say uh, that, um, uh, you know, not even a tax break and, um, and, and all of these other incentives have really um, caused any uh, big companies to do anything else but buy back stock. Now, I, I, could, I could get a little you know, snarky um, and, and, and say that, but I'm going to start with that um, premise. But what about the harms not materializing that were predicted? But see, for me, that wasn't the objective. That's where I want it. The objective, we could talk about throttling, you know, blocking, and we can talk about all of those things that um, I, I think were worthy of discussion. But to me, it was about protecting the consumer. It, to me, it was saying, this is my personally identifiable information. I don't think you should monetize it without my permission. I think I should know and have control over that. I think that um, you know, my personal information should be protected. And I think there should be an agency on the beat that can do something about it in real time. Not an agency after I've gotten rolled over and say, oh, let me help you up. Let me see if I can peel you off the concrete. That's not what I'm talking about. An agency that is there setting the standard. That was my reasoning for supporting Title II. Well, let's hear from Commissioner O'Reilly. Okay. And because uh, I know he's got a different view. Well, and, I, you know, I, we'll probably be able to talk about this sure. again but in the future. But you I may, uh, your view. I may uh, agree with the first part of my colleague's point. I've been cautious and over the years talking about the investment because there's so many different variables that go into companies making decisions. And it's hard to try to extract one piece out. Um, they've got, you know, they're very dynamic companies. Sometimes they've merged into different things. So it's hard to be able to, uh, to tie it directly to a policy decision uh, and to be able to show this led to this. It's been, you know, it's just really hard. It's like we're trying to produce, you know, this policy on Capitol Hill. This policy produced this many jobs. And you can't, it, it, it's, it's really hard to do that. So I've been very cautious on that. Um, do I think that, that the, the, the less regulatory environment provides uh, entrepreneurs and companies an opportunity to invest? Absolutely, to not have to worry about someone over their shoulder. But I think the policy decisions of net neutrality really matter. And I think most of the 
restrictions are, you know, were phony, right? You know, no blo blocking and no throttling, which companies weren't doing except, you know, in throttling, it made a lot of sense for network management. And so, we were, okay, that was okay. And I just had a conversation with someone about paid prioritization. And it was, it's funny to hear people talk about it because, they, you know, they think about it and you go, oh, they say, well, network slice, you know, we have to have network slicing with a quality of service and I'm willing to pay for that. And I go, what's the difference between that and paid prioritization? They go, I guess there's not really anything different. Uh, why, why, should we, why can't I have this? And I go, well, because there's policy advocates that don't want you to have that. They want everyone to be treated the same, and it makes no, no sense. And so the, the, the conversation is changing on net neutrality. What, what the problematic part that I always found um, beyond those points was, was this idea that and you saw this in the last uh, administration was the change of the position, right? Tom Wheeler early on said, this has nothing to do with rate regulation. And then when he's called upon it by Congress to say, well, then let's make sure it's not about rate regulation. He's like, oh, I didn't really mean, I don't know. We got to keep the options open. And now you see the advocates, many of them who work for him, or they're in the, you know, constantly tweeting the heck away to say, it's about rate regulation. We don't like the rates that ISPs are charging. That's what it's about. That's what Title II is about. And originally, that's what it wasn't about. So this has always been that discussion about how to, you know, take a policy, use some fancy, you know, words that rhyme, and then therefore let it be whatever we want it to be at the given moment. Give the commission authority to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants. That's kind of what we had with the enforcement structure that we were setting up, and let the enforcement bureau do whatever the heck it wants. And if you've seen any of the recent enforcement items, you should be just as troubled now as you ever were. These are not, you know, this is not sufficient work for an agency. And to, to dedicate a whole segment of our economy to a bureau to, to, to basically do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, and, you know, it, is, it, was, it was lunacy then and it's lunacy now. Well, part you know. of what you hear and see, I suspect, is fueled by some arbitrary rises in um, in, uh, in, in rates when it comes to services. You know, just, just look at, oh, I've got a modem in my home. I own a modem, but then I get charged for, a, you know, a, a rate. You know, I mean, how arbitrary, you know, is that? Um, you know, I mean, it, it, my provider right now can figure out, they know where I am, and they can sell that data to somebody else. Uh, you know, how comfortable, you know, is that? Um, my Firefighter, if I have a, an incident at the home, uh, a company is able to throttle uh, their connection and, and, and charge them more in order to it not to happen. How comfortable am I with that? And so when you speak about, you know, again, all of these things, we can talk about, um, you know, how people advocate, um, you know, uh, what they say when they're in and out of government. Um, or, you know, we, we can talk about that, but at the end of the day, I really don't think people want somebody taking where they are, taking their um, health information and using that and leveraging that and making business decisions behind that without their knowledge. Okay. And so that, you know, uh, well, you asked. No. <laughs> no, it yeah, the point's well taken. We, you've, you, we talked about the privacy issue, and there's something Congress completely disagreed with the decision and, 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 and acted on. You say, well, that was inappropriate or whatever the case may be, but that's what they get to do. They're elected for that purpose, and they made a decision. That's saying, we overrule the commission's actions, and we're putting our foot down. That, that's what they get to do. Now, one thing I do yeah. worry about, I know he, he is not going to ask me back. I'm just going to go ahead and, and go <laughs> for it, right? Um, I think, honestly, um, and this is something somebody says, and I know this is going to make the thing. I think the FCC split its shorts right here, and let me tell you why I say that. <laughs> is, that a, is that a South Carolina expression? No, I got that from right. somebody from right in this region. I won't out her because she works okay. at the FCC. Okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> look, I think this repeal has put the FCC in a weakened position when it comes to the administration of the Universal Service Fund. I really do. Because if you say, oh, this is an information service, then what authority do you have to support information service, you know, in terms of broadband-enabled infrastructure? What authority do you have to allocate millions of dollars 
for an information service. Okay, on that well, point, well, I, I think, think it's only fair to ask since it was a question posed okay. uh, by my colleague. It, it wasn't in the form of a question. It wasn't in the form of the question. I would say that if you see Section 254, it's broader than a telecommunications service. It was written for that purpose. Uh, we have the ability to collect funds on it and to expend funds uh, that are unrelated to a telecommunications service. So there's one segment. I think that you know you can talk about a lot of the other pieces uh, being you know, outside what would happen, but that was one where I don't have concern. Uh, that's been kind of a, you know a, a false narrative put out there. Okay, on that uh, specific question, though, am I correct that there's a proceeding now as a result of the remand in the Mozilla case that's actually going to deal with this question? So everyone will uh, have a chance to uh, submit their views, and then right. Commissioner O'Reilly will have a chance to to vote on it. So that's and it's an important question, but it that's is. out that's out there. Uh, Boy, this is fun, though, I have to say right now, but there are times I don't want to end up in the position of being like one of those deba uh, moderators at the Democrat de Democratic debates, so I'm going to keep control of this thing. Are you and really? You, you will You'll be. See. <laughs> you, please, please don't uh, dare me. Don't, don't, don't give me a challenge. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, Commissioner Rod, I'm going to tell you. Hang on. Yeah, okay. I will tell so you. Here, but, Good luck. Okay. I will test you. <laughs> I just want to follow up, <laughs> up with something Commissioner O'Reilly said, so this is really for you in the context of talking <clears throat> about net neutrality and the enforcement. And by the way, I'll just say really quickly for my own part that in listening to you both, I think that you know, there, there's a difference. It, for me, it's always important to think about the cost and the benefits of regulation because they're both and they're, so I've, I, I tend to think of it really in terms of a default position, but not not necessarily the position you end up with, but kind of the presumptive default being not to regulate absent, you know, strong evidence that the the uh, benefits outweigh the, the cost. And but there are other ways of looking at it, and uh, which differ from my own view. You talked about, uh, I think you were bringing up forfeitures when you talked about the enforcement process and fines and things the enforcement bureau was doing. But I, I think. I recall seeing just in the past week or so that you issued a statement at the time, or, or maybe gave a statement at the time, the uh, forfeitures were announced against the wireless carriers for the uh, location yes. data. Can, and I, but I didn't, didn't know, or I'll just ask you this way, can you tell us any more about the types of concerns that, that you're interested in looking at or that that bother you if you're looking for reforms in the current process? Because again, you've sure. been a leader on the reform. Well, I look at, I, I generally don't make statements on NALs. And so we didn't get to the, we're not to the forfeiture stage, but we're at the NAL stage. Right. Um, I do right. believe, um, and, and made this part of my statement, I had trouble with it for such a long investigation with the content of the item, the, the description of the doc, the, the material, the facts, and then the remedy side or the penalty side, depending on what your, your viewpoint. I thought that both were lacking um, for what we would expect after such a long time. That's different than whether I believe that we should have investigated. I believe there's enough material and the, the case was made for an NAL. If these were forfeiture items, I think they're very suspect. Um, hopefully, in the meantime, will have filled in a lot of work uh, and done a lot more, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot more pieces uh, to the puzzle before we ever get to the forfeiture side. I'm very anxious or interested in hearing from the parties themselves. Um, there were definitely changes that were made just, you know, towards the end of the process that, you know, called into question how much the commission actually knew about what the heck was going on. But part of that was because the commission hadn't talked to anybody. And that's, that, to me, is a problem. OK, I want to turn to Spectrum. You, you know, we could have a whole afternoon here on discussing the various proceedings on Spectrum and, and uh, the different ways you can think about it. But we can't do that now. And so I want to focus uh, on this question uh, now. And it picks up on a discussion earlier today during the, the panel. You, you have the 5.9 gigahertz proceeding, the 6, <coughs> six gigahertz proceeding uh, now that, that everyone's familiar with here. And I, I think there's an awareness among 
a great many people of the uh, role that unlicensed spectrum plays in a positive sense in terms of broadband. You know, if we're thinking about broadband beyond 2020, and you know, I'll confess that uh, five or ten years ago, I didn't think of unlicensed spectrum in the way that I do now, playing that role versus licensed spectrum. But I want to ask this question, uh, and I'm going to pose it to you first, since you're sitting on the commission now. When, when you think about uh, having to allocate spectrum between licensed and unlicensed spectrum, and this is coming up in the six gigahertz proceeding, uh, which is before you now, but it'll come up in other contexts and does. What are there principles <laughs> that you apply in, in thinking about how to, to do that, or is it just simply a much more ad hoc process? How, what, are, what I how say do you approach it? Well, okay. A couple things. One, I've been blessed, great staff, um, and also getting to issues early. I, I've been speaking about spectrum issues years before the commission. Now everyone talks about six gigahertz. I was the you know original advocate. 5.9, I've, I've got the scars to prove you know the pain on, on those issues. And we can talk about C-band or 3.5 or all the other things that I've worked really hard for a number of years that now are really mature. Um, but you know, it's not an either or. Um, and one of my colleagues who's not on the other side of the aisle who's not here, and a good friend, had, had always advocated for kind of an unlicensed dividend. That when anytime you made a decision on spectrum involving license, a portion had to go to unlicensed. And I never thought that was the right formula. And I've said as much because you, 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 the, it's not going to fit in that you're going to want to take a portion of C band and say, oh, this has to be unlicensed. It's going to make more sense in other bands where you want to make sure you have a, a very fulsome unlicensed portfolio. When we're talking about 5.9, unlicensed makes a complete sense there, given it's right next to 5 gigahertz, which is mostly an unlicensed band. So the, the synergies you can get from that make complete sense. And 6 gigahertz just happens to be right above that. And so we talk about what do you do for 6 gigahertz, which is the heart of your question. Do you make it all for unlicensed right. or do you break off right. a portion for the, for the licensed guys? I'm all for finding more spectrum for the licensed uh, community. I am implore the agency that we're going to need to do more work for the pipeline. What I said, and I said publicly and I said as much as last week, I'm not sure that the case has been made that licensing makes sense in 6 gigahertz given the factors and the issues that have to go into that because it means relocating people, uh, be, people's being wrong, be relocating current licensees somewhere else. And people say, okay, take the energy guys and put them at 7 gigahertz. And you're like, all right, do the energy guys want to move? And I've talked to them, they don't. Okay, they'd rather have unlicensed than they'd rather have to move. Is DOD ready to have new entrance into seven gigahertz? Doesn't seem to be the case. So what I've said is I don't think that plan is ex exactly viable. If someone wants to show me more facts to that, I'm willing to listen. And so I've kept an open mind, but I think the facts haven't matched up with what you know what people have, have thought they might be. And that's so that's so that's an easier decision. It's not a picking either or. I don't have to pick red or blue. Um, I let the facts say, gee, this one's not. This is not sufficient. Um, and then I look and see all the benefits that can come. I was in a demo on Friday afternoon getting to see Wi-Fi 6E and it, at the commission in 8 South, for those of you who, former commission people. Um, and I got to see what you know, the latency and the benefits of what, what consumers are going to see if we're able to make 160 megahertz channels. Eventually, Wi-Fi 7, we're talking 320 megahertz channels. Um, really important. Um, benefits to consumers. And the point you, you started off with, I think, is very valuable. The, it, 10 years ago, five years ago, unlicensed, it was a competition between the two. But today, there are synergies between the two. They're very sim they they complement each other very much so. And the content and the traffic from licensed service is being offloaded at a rate of 70, and I've seen uh, estimates of 80% of licensed traffic is going to be moved to a, a unlicensed service over time period. Um, we're already at over 50% that's being moved, and now we could be at 80% uh, going forward. So unlicensed plays an incredibly important role for the licensed community. Did you want to say anything on this subject? So uh, I'm going to make some people chuckle and others say, hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm going to the book of Revelations on this. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> I knew I would get that. 
you know, the, it, it, the my, <coughs> made you excuse cough. me. Excuse um, me. It, the book of Revelation speaks to um, how either being hot or cold, um, it, you know, you, you have to be either hot or cold, being lukewarm, if you're lukewarm, uh, you're done. Um, so the Mignon translation of that and what made me, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my maker is, has a sense of humor too. So, um, uh, you know, go to that scripture is I've got clients um, that see this one way or the other. You know, I've got uh, one client that talks about how not all spectrum is created equal. And maybe we all can agree on that, that balance should be maintained at to, and that to deploy 5G networks, uh, wireless providers need low, medium, mid, and high band spectrum. That, um, that we face a critical shortage when it comes to licensed spectrum, especially in the mid-band range. Um, and you know what the benefits would be when it comes to that. Then I've got another client um, who um, uh, feels that it is critical that more spectrum is made available to address the growth in 5G traffic. That unlicensed, and we know this to be true, is often used to unload, um, offload, or unload that traffic from mobile networks carries a lot of uh, cloud traffic and is needed to support bandwidth intensive um, and time sensitive applications that would be spawned by 5G. So what is clear to me, um, governed by the book of revelations, <laughs> is that there are tensions here and, and they should be harmonized. I would say both your clients are right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well I was gonna say with that answer, I don't think you lost clients on either side. So, I hope not. Uh, that was well done. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, again, earlier today, I did refer to the book of Exodus when I was talking about the 10 plagues. So now we've had at least two books of the Bible there you go. Uh, mentioned today. So we're going to wind up this way. I'm just going to do two other areas and I'm going to end up with media regulation, which is really important. And when, when I, know, I, I know there are some differences between um, Minion and Mike on, on this, and that'll, that'll be a an important way to, a fun way to end up. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask uh, this question, and uh, you know, it's it's about a topic that is not as well uh, known generally, and not not elevated in the discussion as much. But for professional reasons and personal reasons, it's important to me, and that's the uh, IP caption telephone service. This is the service that uh, is available. Uh, made available uh, to assist those with hearing impairments with communications and, and the commission, uh, you know, run, administers this service that the uh, providers provide. And uh, there's a, historically, the way the rates for that service have been set have been based on the cost submitted by the carriers. We, you know, that's a traditional rate making approach that you familiar with from even your South Carolina Public Service Commission days, they submit their costs and right. you know, you, <clears throat> you end up with rates. The commission has a proceeding now uh, in which it's looking at reforming various aspects of the IP caption telephone service to modernize it, I would say. And one of the, one of the proposals is to move away from the, what I'll call the submitted cost approach and to examine whether uh, the program could be run more effectively and cost efficiently and therefore, in my view, be more sustainable over the long term if, if there were a different rate making approach. And so it's, it's, it's put out for comment uh, in fairly brief terms, but I, I think it's worth highlighting whether the uh, approach should be change to either a price cap regime or even a reverse auction. Uh, you know, I've long been an advocate in particular circumstances of re reverse auctions, but you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I was an advocate of price caps. So both of those, you know, to cut to the chase are more market oriented, I would say more market oriented approaches than the traditional, you know, cost here are my cost claims. Uh, again, Commissioner O'Reilly uh, did, uh, I think, encourage uh, the willingness to look, look at those uh, methods. Uh, another example, I think, where you've you know, taken a lead on something important. But my question is, where does that proceeding stand at this point? And are you 
uh, are you, based on what you know now, I know you're not at the end of the road, but are you uh, going to continue to uh, push for either one of those re uh, reforms? Uh, absolutely. As, as Randy indicated, I've pushed for a reverse auction. Um, I, I think that the there's, there's more time I need to convince my colleagues and others to, to move forward on such a thing. It's not unlike the fight. I wrote one of the first amendments on Capitol Hill uh, to do reverse auctions for universal service subsidies. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, and my old boss was committed to it, but we couldn't get it. And then eventually we were able to get it, uh, get acceptance in some capacity and we're able to move that debate. And then I moved that debate to the commission. And now it's second nature. The chairman uh, obviously is a big fan of them and, and, and adopted the, the model and worked really hard to make it happen uh, in CAF phase two. And we're going to move forward in RDOF. I mean, so those things take time to change the mindset. People are used to price rate regulation, and to move away from that, it wasn't something we did overnight on price caps, and it's not gonna be something we can move overnight on, on reverse auctions. But we have to move away from the current structure, which is just going up and up and up. The burden on consumers is going up and up and up, and what we're getting is less and less. We're getting fewer competitors, we're getting less innovation, uh, we're getting less benefit than we should be getting uh, from such services. I think the second component to that discussion is a need to rely um, or adopt um, more involvement from those free applications that exist today. We pay for a considerable amount. We're talking over a billion dollars today, a billion five uh, in TRS, um, and it's gonna only increase over time. That's, that's you know, it's it, in itself it's unsustainable, um, and we have to, we, we should be looking at new um, adoption of um, free services that exist today to take some of that traffic that's being used um, in a very costly manner and use other technology. It doesn't mean that you eliminate the programs. I'm not for that. Um, just like I'm not for eliminating Lifeline program, as you both know. But I think there's a, an ability to modernize the program, put some cost efficiencies using market mechanisms, and then move traffic that doesn't have to be done a certain way um, into other technologies. Okay, uh, I do want to end up with uh, media regulation because I think that's important and, and I know that the, these two commissioners have views on that. I, I will say uh, Commissioner O'Reilly brought up Lifeline. I know Commissioner Clyburn uh, that you've been a, a champion of that. I don't, let's save uh, a, a further discussion of that for another day, okay. I, but I, you know, you know I, I, I do, say, but I know, you, well, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just say for you, that I know you, you've been a, you, you've been a champion uh, of it. I've been, you know, I, I, I've, I've been a long time supporter of the Lifeline program because I, I think in general in, in our free market economy, and, and this applies to other things like food stamps and whatever, that you have to have a safety net and that that's important. It's, you know, we, there are always going to be debates about how you administer it and where you draw lines and, and, and that type of thing. And, uh, but but I'm, I'm a supporter of the program as well. And I know Commissioner Riley just said that he was. And, and I'll just, you know, say that when you were uh, chairwoman, uh, I thought that you uh, took the initiative to uh, implement, or I, I forget how it exactly worked, but at least begin the, the process of implementing reforms that were important that helped keep a program like that in the same way that I was asking about the IP CTS, or to help keep them sustainable, really, because they need uh, public support to be sustainable. Now, uh, let's uh, just close by talking about media regulation, because you know you can't have a telecom policy conference in today's environment and not, not uh, address that important topic. And I think the way that I'm going to get into that, uh, first I'll <clears throat> turn to Commissioner O'Reilly. Well, let me ask this question and then we can see who we're, <laughs> we're turning to. But I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to actually repeat uh, a question almost verbatim that I asked two years ago at this same conference to Commissioner O'Reilly, and it, it, you know, I think it illustrates it could have been four years ago, probably, or, or uh, you know, perhaps six or eight 
years ago because <clears throat> the, to my mind, the, uh, from my own perspective, uh, the, the uh, deregulation has come way too slowly, but uh, that's what we're going to discuss. So here's what I said to Commissioner O'Reilly two years ago. Quote, I just reread your October 2017 blog, Thoughtfully Modernizing the Media Ownership Rules. Do you remember that blog? Uh, and I said, and I agree it is thoughtful, not just because you advocate some measures that I have long advocated, in some cases for more than a decade. For example, eliminating some of the cross-ownership bans, but while you make the case essentially that we now live in an age of media abundance as a result of technological and marketplace changes, the opponents of change continue to assert the existence of media consolidation and a scarcity of diversity of viewpoints, while a wide gulf between the two views. You said then, Commissioner Riley, and I'm sure Sure, you probably feel even more strongly about it now, but we'll find out. Here's what you said two years ago. Quote, we must define the media market as it exists today. That means the inclusion of newspapers, radio stations, and television stations, but also their competitors, MVPDs, over-the-top providers, internet sites, social media platforms, streaming music services, and satellite radio. Once we accurately acknowledge the market we are regulating, we can have an honest debate about what rules ultimately make sense. So what will it take to convince those who oppose eliminating or relaxing media ownership restrictions, like perhaps uh, the person sitting here to my right, to say that you're, that you're right? What are the next steps uh, to... Uh, get rid of outdated. I think that's a rhetorical question, right? I'm not sure how I can convince. We've had this debate for, for, for quite a while. I haven't uh, figured out the, the right formula to convince uh, people that the market has changed considerably, um, that, that the current media companies are under assault from a lot of different sources, uh, that they are migrating their business models. If you're an MVPD, you, have, you more than likely started an over-the-top service uh, for purposes of uh, bypassing a number of uh, existing regulations or uh, getting to a marketplace uh, that, that, that is seen uh, that is more attractive. Um, and, and that we hold on to these regulations, the past regulations and statutory burdens in some instances um, that are only harming existing business models. Um, and, and that to me is, is, is unacceptable, but I haven't figured out a path to get away from the Third Circuit Court review. Um, I, you know, we had talked to, you know, if you look at our last quadrennio, I had teed up the issue and the chairman was nice enough to include an examination of, of a, a market definition. What is the marketplace that we're talking about? So then you can figure out some of these other components. We're, we're stuck. And if you believe that, if anyone believes that the status quo is what you're in favor of, um, then you have won. The status quo of 1996, the burdens that we, um, that imposed in the 96 Act, um, and, and that, that have been changed very infrequently since then, if you support them, they have been stuck in time since 1996. But the marketplace has completely changed since then. Um, I'm still amazed when I, people come in, in and say, I needed, you know, you got to change media ownership for television or radio. And I say, well, why don't you take your content and, and go in a different mechanism where people are making more money and there are, you know, new distribution models? They say, oh, we're doing that too, but we've got to make sure we still get a portion of, of our bus carry, or our, of our retrans rights and we got to make sure we have carriage and all these things that are in the old models and it's like you have a platform that you can use it's almost free to distribute your content um, and you're just making you try to make sure you have to be forced on the old models that are that are being suffocated uh, by our current regulations so I haven't figured out that formula I'm incredibly depressed um, on where we are and I don't see any immediate changes um, given I was hoping for I was really hoping that this year we get to change the definition of the market. We'd really be able to reform the radio ownership rules 
That way you could certainly get rid of a number of the burdens on cross ownership that make no sense. I mean, does it have? To, do we have to wait until the last newspaper closes, or that we'll have four? Right, we'll have four newspapers that can make money, and everything else is gone before we realize that the cross ownership. Well, it's not the sole burden is a burden, and therefore no longer makes any sense. How many times have we won that in court, only to be thrown back and say, "Well, look at it again." You're like, how many times do you have to win something to then still lose at it? And so I'm. I'm frustrated and I don't know the answer and I don't see it you know in the in the near immediate getting clear can you please alleviate Commissioner O'Reilly's depression not here? a chance uh, um, no let me ask not a chance. wait hold but, on just one second. I'm gonna you're gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna let you speak okay words, but I just wanted to find out for my own uh, purposes is the Commission gonna seek maybe I've lost track of time but it, uh, the question of whether you're gonna seek cert is still uh, I guess Pending. I know it's not solely the commission, yeah, that's but the, what, the what's happening? The chairman's still considering that, and the time frame was extended uh, by the by the the, the court had asked had we'd asked the, the administration in partnership with the FCC had asked for a little more time to consider whether to seek cert, um, and it was granted, and so they're in the process of analyzing whether to do so. So I'm not going to have a, an especially coherent answer because this is something I am honestly I will confess to being too emotionally attached to. I really am. Um, we have had our moments um, when it comes to my desire to seek um, and to get more data and more study. Um, because what frustrates me here is almost how we began is you've got um, you know people saying, look at how many you know, look at how much things have changed. Uh, look at how many options you have. But what, what, what is not being said is how we got there and how, in some ways, the FCC has put his, its uh, thumb on the scale in a, to ensure that we got here, uh, much at the, you know, the detriment of um, you know, those uh, diverse um, owners. Um, and so, uh, again, I'm not going to be especially coherent, but I, I will say here um, that not... Um, Enabling studies and demonizing um, someone who's trying to, and I got demonized, um, you know, to get studies for us to review, to not take ownership of past practices that have gotten us to where we are today is, uh, you know, just a regulatory malpractice. And so that's why I said, you know, um, that no, no, that's the, the uh, one of uh, a couple of places where uh, we're, we're probably never going to be on the same page because um, to me, the entire premise um, is faulty and I just can't uh, embrace it. Okay. Well, you know, there are differences that we all have based on our uh, own view of uh, principles. And uh, again, uh, you, you weren't here at the beginning, but one thing I said at the outset of the conference this morning, and I, I say it every year, that, that we have our uh, principles at the Free State Foundation, which uh, we characterize as, as free market and respect for property rights and respect for the rule of law, and we believe in those. But the other thing that I always say, Minion, is that we understand that everyone doesn't have the same beliefs. We respect those, and uh, of course, and uh, that's one reason you're here, by the way, and why I'm sure you'll be, I'm sure you'll be back. You and, sure? And I, I, I'm sure. <laughs> you heard and, it, right? And, and, uh, it's it's being recorded, and I think discussions like this. The other thing I said was, there's always, you know, in in my view, when you have discussions like this. You know, even if it's not apparent uh, immediately, you know, in the the moment, uh, it, it's always useful, and and we all can uh, learn from each other, and that's that's the way that I approach things, and uh, I always always will. Uh, I want to just say I'm very grateful that that you two were here today. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent a good part of yesterday wor worrying about what today was going to be like watching watching the news and, uh, you know, for at least my own purposes, I think this conference today has really been terrific. Our speakers were, were really, really good and, and having you two uh, here uh, with me at the end of it made it extra special. So thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned.